when I was in college, my parents wrote me good newsy letters. Uh, here's a quote from one that my mother wrote me in 1985. The biggest news is that dad has been elevated to a named chair in the history department. That means that he is now to be known as the H. Rodney Sharp Professor of History. No more money is involved, but it is a considerable honor. He takes it calmly. His picture was also in the paper this week with a shower cap cutting corn at the cannery. So he lives many lives. Love, mother. Richard has always been a dual citizen. He's interested in everything, but his faith is just as capacious as his intellectual life. It's easy to say, be bilingual, speak the language of the academy and speak the language of faith. It's another thing entirely to actually do it. Richard is one of the LDS faithful scholars who has helped to collapse the divide between the realm of the spirit and the realm of the intellect. I have never been much impressed with the um, discipline or science, if you wish, of apologetics. I've never yet seen an apology for Christianity that I thought was um, airtight. What does impress me and makes an influence on my life is the example of individuals whose scholarship and more important, whose life I would like to emulate. People like Richard, I think the quality of his life as a Christian comes first. And then that uh, seeps through into the scholarship. So when I'm in high school, it was the 70s. There are all kinds of sociocultural issues coming up. And a friend of mine said, what does your father think about this or about that? I said, you know, I don't really know. I've never asked him. He said, how can you not ask him? He's the most enlightened person we know. If one ever wanted an advertisement for the Mormon faith and how it is lived and, and how it can be, then Richard and Claudia would be the prime examples. Richard was a very good student, but his family moved when he was in high school, and he attended his new high school as a very lonesome person. But a friend of his in the church told him that he should run, that he had to run for student body president. This was a hard thing for him because he just didn't want to do that, but um, he finally decided that he could. There was a, would be a large group of people running for office. And uh, the only requirement was that you had to give a talk. And he, um, he had no manager, no signs, nothing, but he could give a very good talk because he was a Mormon and had been talking all his life in church. And he knew that he had to finish up with a joke and he got a couple of good jokes from his father. And he went on and gave this talk and it was a big hit. He won on the first ballot, the student body presidency. So it was his talking that got him the job. So because he, he was still a loner and uh, he managed, uh, made some friends and he uh, got along very well with the, act, with the, with the uh, faculty. And one time there was a person coming from uh, Harvard as a recruiter. Richard's decision to come to Harvard as an undergraduate leaving the safety of Mormon culture, he deliberately chose to live in two worlds. I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the absolute keys to his life. And he immediately felt at home at Harvard. It was a place that uh, just spoke to him in so many ways. Richard has a very unique CV. His vita is unlike any scholar that I'm aware of. One of the things that has been fascinating to me from the beginning is his ability to excel at a variety of subfields within the historical profession. He would come home after a long, hard day at the books, and he would hit the bed and be gone. And uh, But I just needed some company, and so I'd wake him up. I'd think, Richard, Richard, tell me something interesting. What did you learn today? What did you <laughs> he would pull himself out of his stupor and try and say a few sentences. He was pretty good at it. I felt bad about doing it. I knew he needed his sleep. But, you know, I was bored. I needed something to think about. I don't think it's a coincidence that Richard has, has developed his capital in both of those spheres. He won his Bancroft for a work that had nothing to do with Mormonism. 
After Richard won the Bancroft Prize, he was a very hot property. Some of the people were very persistent and just kept after him. And one was Sid Burrell from Boston University. We were already living there because we were on sabbatical in, in Boston and Cambridge. He felt so bad about uh, leaving BYU that he carried around a letter of resignation in his pocket for something like a week. Eventually, Richard was um, persuaded that he probably should go to Boston University where he had opportunity to open a new field, uh, the study of American studies. He was at Boston University and they were looking for a, uh, the first full-time director of the American, American and Indian Studies program. And he came to New Haven and he said, uh, would this interest you? I'd grown up in a family that was very interested in New England material culture, New England history. That was going to be, a, that became, a, as you probably know, a big dimension of the program that, that uh, Richard then carried with him to Delaware. It was one of the reasons he went to Delaware. Refinement of America was a spectacular book. I think that is the book which established him as, as one of the central scholars of American cultural history. From the moment it appeared, it's been uh, extremely persuasive and influential. It continues to stand uh, as an absolutely major achievement. We go to Colonial Williamsburg every year for a few days. And I remember saying, you know, there's there's Bush Gardens just down the road with this great amusement park. Shouldn't we, you know, even like to spend an afternoon there or something? Like, no, no, we don't, we don't do that sort of thing. I used to joke I was the only eight-year-old that knew the difference between a Windsor and a Queen Anne chair. He's really a masterful synthesizer. He's learned the, the, the art of taking a small small thing or some, something specific and uh, un, un, unfolding its, its meaning. He was uh, so fortunate that he has never applied for an academic job. Everyone came to him for academic stuff. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> His ability to situate early Mormonism within, within um, early American intellectual, social, cultural history without ever reducing it to that. This is where his identity as a believer intersects with his work as a historian, that I think he, he really sees Mormonism as greater than the sum of its parts. He agreed to write for the 16-volume history under Leonard Arrington a sketch of the early Joseph Smith in his background. And my mother loved that book. She was his best promoter. She took it around to all her friends. She said, oh, you've got to read this. This has to be on your list. So when Richard decided that he would write the biography of Joseph Smith, which is something he had thought that he might always do someday, uh, he felt that he wasn't really uh, equipped to do it. He hadn't done enough of the background research and uh, it had to be done by a certain date. So it occurred to him that it would be a good idea to recruit a number of um, graduate students uh, to work together during summer it turned out that the summer seminars were really wonderful experiences for everybody, for the teacher and for the students uh, who came and who developed wonderful, long-lasting relationships. But it wasn't really absolutely the best for, the, <laughs> for doing research. But it was okay because um, it turned out that that was a, a long-lasting, valuable project to get those graduate students together during the summer and uh, they have considered it their boot camp in um, being uh, church historians. The impact, the legacy of that seminar series, it speaks for itself in the accomplishments of its graduates. Here's someone that has no business listening to first year graduate students carefully. You know, he could walk in and just put his Bancroft prize on the table and say, now I'm going to say some things and you all better take notes. That's just not how he works. He's always focused on the other person. I remember being at a conference once and a young Latter-day Saint woman came up to him and said, so you're Richard Bushman. You're the one who knows all about Joseph Smith. And he humbly said, I thought all Mormons knew all about Joseph Smith. Rather than taking the credit himself, he just deflects it. He'll be remembered for mentoring a generation of scholars, helping people feel confident that it was worthwhile to study Latter-day Saint history and theology. Two of the most meaningful things about participating in Richard's seminar was first how he created community. Richard is just so great at connecting people. 
And the second was how he taught a particular mindset. And so his mindset was, let's do this work about the church, about our religious tradition, and let's do it with such academic rigor and such creativity that it just has to be taken seriously. I don't think it's any exaggeration at all to say that without Richard Bushman, not only would I be a poorer scholar, but I don't think I'd be a scholar at all of all the people who have contributed to my intellectual and occupational development. Nobody has been more influential than Richard Bushman. He taught me what it means to be a disciple scholar. I couldn't believe that he was that invested in me. And it was immediate. He, my future mattered to him a lot. And the thing about that that's so great is it was sincere, it was complete, and it was not unique to me. He's that way with lots. Everybody who's going to watch this video is going to have their own version of that story. I feel like that has been a touchstone of his career, not skirting diff difficult issues, but having the courage to tackle them and understand them. And as he said in the meeting, that if you go right through the knot, there's something good on the other side. He's willing to take on in Mormonism some of the Gentile critiques of Mormonism, and but he also listens to those critiques. So I think as a Mormon scholar, that's not true of every Mormon scholar by a long shot. Rough Stone Rolling is one of those two or three works in Latter-day Saint intellectual history that were in, of, in and of themselves watershed moments. He loves Joseph Smith enough to reckon with the 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 hard facts of his life that the love is expressed in that kind of reckoning he inaugurated a new era in the study of mormonism and he particularly led the way for young scholars to find their way to their own research interests their own questions to get access to the tools of the academy and find a level of comfort there that they had not in the past and i think that will be marked as a turning point, one of several turning points in the historiography of Mormonism, but this one will be identified with Richard. There's just no question about that. There was a reason why I think journalists kept coming to him, why he became kind of the face of the Mormon intellectual and Mormon historical community, you know, for, for so many decades. Years ago, when Mitt Romney was running for president, you know, there was all this interest in the Mormon church and dad being this Columbia guy made him very palatable to kind of the Eastern press. And he was invited down to this event at the put on by the Pew Foundation. And I called him and I said how impressed I was with this and how it was really amazing. And um, I said, you know, truly, how'd you manage it? You know, just why'd you deal with that? And he said, uh, well, you know, actually, you know, whenever there was a break, I would just go back to my hotel room and just pray and pray and pray and for guidance and how to convey these uh, this information in a way that was useful to the church and useful to and true to the what he meant to say. I, you know, I am a strong believer in prayer um, because probably a lot because of my father. We've had a lot of discussions about it, and he, you know, deeply depends on prayer. Providence is a term that um, I remember a lot. He has this lead kindly light kind of way of thinking about it. And if he can be, a, you know, uh, flexible to follow, you know, many small strokes of inspiration that, um, uh, you know, be directed in the best path. It was great to have him as my seminary teacher because I realized much later is that it's very interesting to learn the scriptures from a social historian who sees things in the scriptures that most people can't see. When dad was starting the Mormon studies chair at Claremont University in California, he went to lunch with another faculty member. His colleague asked him somewhat incredulously, how can you believe all these things? And he replied, when I follow these principles, I become the man that I want to be. It's never about him. It's always about the other person. He's a great brother. I love him. 
among all the extraordinary things about him, one of the most extraordinary is that he has changed Mormon culture twice. I think he was the one that convinced uh, the Latter-day Saint Church that we do not have to be afraid of our history. And the second, and you think, how can anyone age 85 start on a second big cultural sea change, is to make us appreciate our artistic history, appreciate our artists as a representation uh, of our culture and our thoughts and our feelings. So, uh, so in 2016, Richard came to me with a really simple question. If somebody gave you $50 million, what would you do with it? I wanted to create a resource for the bigger picture of, of LDS creative arts. And so what I said to Richard was, if we did this properly, an organization that really took the big picture of creative arts could have a lot of impact. And one of the things that Richard said was our understanding of the art of our culture today is where our understanding of, of our history was 50 years ago. So he kept using the phrase that art is the, is the great frontier of Mormon studies. He believes that art tells the story of a people. We are a culture. He's proud of his, his LDS culture. He believes that art is the way to really tell that story adequately. Dance is a fine art. It's an expressive fine art, and it allows our humanity to make commentary on how we live, how we worship our God. I appreciate Richard being a contributor and supporting all of fine, fine arts. He gave a number of lectures on paintings and other images of the first vision. And it was the first time that I had ever seen him interpret artwork. And he had some insights into artwork that I, I found completely astounding. I mean, he was really, really talented in this. He lives these ideals that he sees in the, in the past and in the history and in the doctrine of the church. And essential, I think, to those is this ideal of friendship. But when he retired from Columbia, he took up a second career as a community builder. The thing that stands out about Richard for me is not only, as I said, that vault of a mind, of uh, historical context that he has, but his ability to network and to be a very inclusive of people. When you talk with him, uh, you feel as if you've known him for years. I often think that Richard has, um, has this ability to see the chessboard and to see um, when things should happen, how they should happen in, in a way that um, sort of speaks to his patients. So to, to some extent, I think it's that he, he has this, this vision. Another thing that I love seeing is how people, through his influence, find their purpose in life, that he'll have an idea or a concept that is so good that everyone has to see how good it is and fall in line with it. The thing about Richard and, and the thing that I've realized is that every time I think I have an original thought about Mormonism, it turns out that Richard had that thought 40 years ago. <laughs> But what is beyond my care is the ideas he gets. I don't know where he comes up with all these things that he puts into effect. <laughs> Whether it's gold plates or a center for the Latter-day Saint arts, I don't know. <laughs> he manages to see it through. So blessing. 